thrilled to be here um, to spend this last hour with you um, and talk about social and emotional learning. How many of you were part of this? I know you've probably been asked this already. I'm really sorry. Um, but how many of you were here the last for last year? How many of you are continuing on? Wow. Oh, so good. And how many of you are new? Just so I could get a lay of the land. Okay, great. So, um, We'll see, I uh, apologize in advance if I go too fast for people who are here for the first time, and I apologize in advance if I say some stuff I already said before to the people who are already here. So, and um, so I think what I'm gonna do in this next little while, just, uh, just as a bit of background, I'm Kim Schonert reichel I'm a professor at University of British Columbia. I have been um, doing research and teaching in the area of social and emotional learning in schools, uh, particularly focused on children's, uh, the development of empathy, compassion, and altruism in children. And I've been, how many of you went to UBC? Oh, woohoo! It's supposed to be 40% of all teachers in the province, so I think that kind of represents that. And I, did anybody have me as a teacher? No? <laughs> no. <laughs> I've been there since 91, <laughs> for Pete's sake. <laughs> there, there's a couple. <laughs> um, so uh, anyways, and um, just a little bit of other background information. I started off as a teacher of seventh and eighth grade and also high school alternative school and also lived and worked in, an alter in a residential treatment institution, a mental institution for children and adolescents. And um, another couple other little tidbits, actually my minor was in reading as, an, uh, as my elementary education degree and so I really focused a lot on reading and uh, French were my two foci and then I got into this whole area of social and emotional learning. And I also always have to also tell people that I'm also the mother of two boys, 13 and 16. Gray uh, is going into high school. I have two boys in high school this year, so any advice I'd take right now. And they start, yeah. What? <laughs> what was it? <laughs> so to drink wine. No. Um, <laughs> okay, so we'll see. Anyways, without further ado, I'll give you a bit of the lay of the land. So I'm going to start with a bit of a background. That was what I just gave you. And a story, which I'll tell you in a minute. Why now? Just briefly, what, um, why we're focusing on social and emotional learning. Um, what now? SEL 101, but I'll get a bit of a sense of what you know already. Some recent science on SEL. Just a couple of things. I always, um, as, a, as a researcher, you know, I'm... I spend my days and you know nights actually doing research, trying to unpack this idea of how do you promote these things in schools? How do children develop? What can we do in context to help support children? So I'm going to give you some recent scientific findings of what we know about children's uh, social and emotional learning development, and then end with some practical strategies. Um, but with a, a anyway, so I'll, I'll give you some of that, and hopefully we'll get through most of it. And if not, the whole PowerPoint will be available on the website, so you can go through everything. So just a couple of I'm going to reiterate a couple of things I've said again and again and again, but I cannot start uh, say, emphasize enough that the foundation of all children's development and learning is in a context that is loving, supportive, and nurturing. That is the foundation. It is about creating that base, that safe base for all children. And I'm going to say the love word, because I think a lot of times we don't necessarily say love. Um, but when I worked with kids, I loved my children. <laughs> and um, I think we really have to think about that idea of how we create that that really caring context, because that's where they learn. Um, in the words of one of my uh, colleagues uh, and former students, Ty Binfett, you learn best when you feel best, the best. And I love that motto, you know, the idea of how can we create, you know, what are the conditions in our classroom that we can feel the best so we can learn the best, you know, and getting kids engaged in that. It is important to provide students with opportunities and specific skills to learn about social and emotional competence, to learn emotion words, to identify their emotions, to be able to identify the emotions of others, to be able to know when they're angry or sad and how, how they, when they feel that way and what they can do about it. Um, when they're stressed, 
because we know that those that awareness and being able to know how to manage those emotions helps have more healthy relationships and so on. And finally, at the heart of this too, is the promotion of adult social and emotional well-being and competence. We need to start with the adults. I, I can't emphasize that enough. For years and years, we started just thinking we have to focus on the kids and let's, you know, one more thing to do. I don't know if any of you have ever, ever heard that. Yeah, for sure. You're giving me one more thing to do without taking care of the adults and really being aware of that. And so, for example, I always use this one. Um, has anyone heard of the Roots of Empathy program? Um, as someone was telling me, I might have told this story last year, so forgive me if I did, but it was a teacher who had the roots of empathy, not anywhere near here, so it's no one that you guys know. It was out east in another province. And um, this teacher was doing um, roots of empathy in her classroom, which is about a bringing an infant into the classroom to be a springboard for talking about how we feel, how others feel, to talk about emotions, and really a way to get children to, to disclose how they're feeling and when they're feeling sad. So the Roots of Empathy instructor was just this group of children sitting around the carpet all saying, let's share a time when we've been sad. And so these children are just, you know, just things that are so heart-wrenching, the times that they've been sad or scared. And they get to the teacher who was also part of this group, and the teacher is sitting there goes, yeah, I'm sad when I have to tell you guys more than twice to do anything. Now, eh. um, clearly that teacher needed some support for her own social and emotional well-being. Um, that teacher was stressed, you know, so how can you promote students' social and emotional well-being without having your own social and emotional well-being supported? And it starts higher up. But again, it just emphasizes where it starts with the adults. And then this just um, talks about the idea of social and emotional learning programs or practices, the creation of learning environments that are safe, caring, well-managed, participatory. I love the last presentation about children's voices. If we could start at the central part of a child-centered environment in which children's voices are listened to and responded to in authentic and loving ways. I think we've done most of our job. I mean, I really think that that's so critical. And then exactly having opportunities to develop self-awareness, social awareness, self-management, relationship skills, and responsible decision making leads to greater attachment to school, less risky behaviors, and things like resiliency are developed, and then better academic performance and success in school and life. And, um, and just this uh, one quote I've showed you before. I just isn't that a beautiful picture? I just love that one. I know I sent it to Maureen at one point. You all, uh, and I have to say, you all, I'll send these. You'll have all the slides. Any of these that you want to take and use in your own presentations or anything like that, please feel free to um, use that. But um, I've asked before who said this. It's um, it's Aristotle. So I thought I'd start with, uh, I was asking Maureen, I have, you know, I have limited time and I was figuring out where to start. You guys are at the end of the day. I can't just fill you. I, I have like, you know, a ton of slides. If anyone's ever been at any of my presentations, you know, I, I have a lot of, I have a lot in my head. I think you have to know. But anyways, I'm going to start with a story because often, don't we wonder why do people do their, what is their passion in life? Why am I so into social and emotional learning? Why has this been my life mission? You know, I've been so lucky to find something that just resonates with me. But it had to do with all the children with whom I've worked over the years. And um, really, one of the examples uh, that I feel so fortunate that really has emphasized to me the importance of context was was when I, after I was teaching the elementary school and then went to teach at this high school, I then after that went to do my master's degree at the University of Chicago. I was living in Chicago at the time. Does anyone pick up my Chicago accent? Okay, a bit. <laughs> Been here for a long time, but I was just back in Chicago not so long ago, so you know how it comes back. Anyway, so I went to this school I had read about, and it was a, a residential treatment institution for kids with severe emotional and behavioral disorders. Basically, it was identified as a hopeless cases. It was the kids who had been in special ed, then hospitalized, then homeschooled. Nothing worked for them, and they, they were sent to this school often for many years you know, sometimes seven, eight, nine years. But it was a school that was based on um, a really different concept of a mental institution. You know, rather than do the um, medication and the straight jackets and the, if anyone's ever worked in any of those places, the orange jumpsuits and the plastic silverware and all of that, the person who started this school in 1944 was a guy named Bruno Bettelheim. 
And Bruno Bettelheim had written a books about love is not enough. But Bruno actually started off, he was a child psychologist living in Vienna in the 30s. And then because he didn't want to leave his mom, being Jewish, he was put in two concentration camps, one called Dachau and one called Buchenwald. And how he survived those two camps because he was kind of, you know, because you have to find some way to survive. I mean, it, he wasn't in a, I, and then I learned there's this whole, there's concentration camps and death camps, like Auschwitz was a death camp. You know, some concentration camp, although many people died, it was not the sole purpose just to put everyone to death. Um, so anyways, at Buchenwald, he survived by observing human behavior. I mean, that's how he did. He pretended like, well, I guess he didn't pretend it. Like, I'm a scientist, a social scientist, going and seeing how do people behave in extreme situations. And he really just noted what happens when you have brutality, loss of autonomy, inconsistency in structure, all of these things. And what he found is, is that people, uh, most people under those conditions fall apart. They lose their sanity. They you know, did all sorts of things. So he, when he came out, he was released, suddenly it was like, it was so weird, it was Hitler's birthday or something. That was how, I guess on Hitler's birthday, they released some prisoners. He was released after a year, sent to Chicago where they would take him. Interesting, uh, there's all these fascinating things, like Yale University wouldn't take Jews. University of Chicago did. Anyway, just so fascinating, that whole thing. Anyways, he went to University of Chicago, they gave him this school. They said he, they knew he had studied children or something. They gave him this school. And he decided, how can I take the, what I learned in the concentration camp and reverse it? If a context has the power to create problems, then sure, you can create a context that would help take you out of it. So he did, created this school. He called it the school, not a mental institution, that was basically the most beautiful place you'd ever want to be. It was the, the, the walls, the, it would look like you were walking into a beautiful family home. Children ate off of China. From uh, here you got, we had 40 children there who were severely emotionally disturbed, who had community meetings every week to have decisions about what was gonna go on in the school. So the first community meeting I went to, the children were making a decision um, because the China plates that they ate off of there was a tea, they had tea sometimes after dinner. <laughs> now this is a mental institution, I just have to say. And the china cups, the handles had, a lot of them had broken, and, but the, the, the set had been discontinued, you know, so they couldn't just go get the new cups. And so the director at the time, Jackie Sander, here, here imagine 45 to 18 year olds sitting on the floor, severely emotionally disturbed, problem behavior, and they're talking about which of the three china cups they were going to vote on to see to replace the china cups for the entire place you know so this idea and so if they were going to get a new if we were going to paint their dormitory we met with the painters and the kids just voted on which color they wanted it every detail they that was their thoughts were valued so anyway, so I went to go work there. I'd applied, actually part of the interview process, three day interviews where you actually meet with the kids and spend time with the kids and the kids have a say so in whether or not you get hired. Because they can pick up, like oh this person might seem like they're really nice but they uh, still think we're crazy, you know, or something. The kids, kids are, those kind of, those kids, or all kids are hypersensitive to an adult not being authentic. So I went to work there and I was first, for the first five months I was a sub. I don't know if any of you have been a sub. It's such a thankless job. You want your own group of kids. And I wanted this. I'd go and be with these group of kids, and they wouldn't even let me. They'd never even learn my name. You know, it was sort of like, oh, whatever, lady, you know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> whatever, can you do this for me? And the, in the school, there were three boys' dorms and three girls' dorms with about seven children in each. They actually went to school in the same building. And um, so fine, but I, I, there were staff meetings every day, lots of collaboration. I love how Faye said collaboration, collaboration. Lots of that, always talking about the kids, always talking about the adults as well, the adults' well-being. But the motto there, and what I loved about this therapeutic milieu, is that you led with empathy. That everything you approached was being thinking about a child's perspective and, and thinking about how can you connect with that child how could you have empathy and identify something with that child and find something about each child that you liked? And in fact, for the first three months of working with a group of kids, you were told never to read their files. That you were told, just make your own impression. Do not bring in preconceived notions of what you think they will be like. You just have that. 
Okay, so here I am, the sub, and I'm going to the staff room in the, e in the evenings after the kids all go to bed, and uh, I'd see Jessica. And Jessica would all be, always be in there. She worked with this group of boys that I heard were really difficult. They were called, um, every group had a, uh, had a name. These were called the Lords. And um, yes, and so Jessica would be there crying and saying, oh, Jeff, oh my goodness, oh, Jeff, and I'd just hear, and then I'd hear this name again, Jeff, Jeff. It turns out, and doing a little bit of understanding, Jeff was a 14-year-old boy, been at the school for a couple of years, had been through a, a traumatic family situation, which I never knew anything about, but had like 160 IQ. So imagine, on the one hand, being really, really disturbed and being really, really smart. Um, and he was, he, so he was so good at being able to find everyone's faults, everyone's problems. And from what I gathered, he also could, he did not like women. Like he did not like any of the female counselors. I know Sabrina told me, one of the counselors, that she served him pancakes and he didn't like how much syrup she put on, so she put the syrup over, he put the syrup over her head. And um, you know, over and over again, all the things about Jeff, this and, so I just, you know, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this guy. But anyway, so one day, but I'm wanting my own group, right? So the, the, head, of the, the head of the school, Jackie Sanders, comes to me one day and says, oh, Jessica's leaving, and so you're going to be the new counselor for the Lords. And I'm like, yay! <laughs> and I really was so excited because it was like, okay, a challenge and, and stuff. So, um, so at that dinner that night where the boys were told I would be their new counselor, the, uh, Jeff comes by the table and goes... Um, when you're finished eating, come up to the dorm. So I was like, oh, this is so good, so positive. He's saying you could finish your dinner. <laughs> no, really, think about it. Like he's like, when you're finished your dinner, like that's a really good, that was a good thing. So I go up there afterward, and the dorm is set up. It's like all these beds and carpets around, and he's over in the corner. And you could see he's very, he's 14-year-old, kind of little for his age, but just so anxious. Like you could feel like just being around him, like the, you, he just, Anyway, so anxious, so he's, and I'm just thrilled that I'm going to be a counselor. So he's pacing in his area. There's a rug and his bed, and you could just, I knew I just couldn't go any closer because he was just so, like then, he goes, okay, um, I uh, have my laundry. I throw my dirty laundry on the floor around here. I want you to pick it up, and when you see it, and put it in this laundry bin right here. Well, I was so thrilled. No, I really was. <laughs> like he was asking me to do something for him. Like this was this this was a big step. Like think about how I would interpret it. It wasn't like this 14-year-old kid who has No, this is a kid who can't really ask anyone to do things for him. Who's asking me to pick up his dirty laundry. No. I used to say dirty laundry, but what do what do we do? You know, if you think back and and think about what do mothers or parents do or caregivers do for infants? You take care of their dirty laundry, diapers and stuff, and you do it lovingly most of the time. Um, and so, so I did, so I go in, and he would have picked up, if I would have shown any hesitation that I, he kind of disgusted me, or if he was someone like that, I would have said no. So anyway, so slowly, slowly he'd start, I'd go into the dorm, he, he wouldn't talk to me, but he might ask me to do a little something. The next thing he asked me to do is go get a towel, a clean towel for him. First time he'd ever asked a female counselor to go and get him a clean towel. Never before. He'd always go wait till the next male counselor came on. Next thing he asked me to do, now this is weird, he asked me to cut his nails, his fingernails. And I thought, oh my goodness, I wonder if I cut them. I'm so scared. But I set it all up and I was very careful. I was like, oh my goodness, he's let me to touch him. And so he, I cut his nails. Slowly by slowly, he was letting me do some stuff, but I knew there were still so many problems. So one night, two oh, so the kids all slept in the school, and there was a night counselor, so if they woke up in the middle of the night, they can go to the night counselor. One night, two o'clock in the morning, knock at my door, knock. I go to my door, put my robe on, go. He's standing there with his arms crossed and said, make me scrambled eggs. Well... My first response could have been, well, you should go to the night counselor, don't bother me. Um, but then I thought again, here's this child, really, who had had many traumas in his life, who was asking me to do something, and what really was the motivation behind him, at, was he really hungry for scrambled eggs at 2 o'clock in the morning? Probably had a nightmare. Woke up scared in the middle of the night, couldn't come and tell me he was scared. So I go, I make him the eggs, I'm down cooking, and 
making them eggs, give him the plate of eggs, and he goes off, and the next morning I see the plate, and everything was fine. And then slowly, 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 um, he starts talking to me and asking me for things, and finally discloses what had been in his file, which I'd kind of heard rumors about, about the extreme sexual abuse he had been subjected to as a child from a family neighbor who's, and his mom told him just to keep quiet about it because she didn't want to disrupt anything. And he, he had had, I mean, numerous, I won't even go into all the things that had happened to this young man's life and, you know, the whole idea that even how he was surviving. So um, it really showed for me this idea of leading with empathy and not judging a child and really responding to them. Just what happened um, a year later, well, this is a year after, one thing we did at the school, which again is a kind of a neat thing to do, again, of a ritual. I love rituals and traditions and things, that each child who was at the school, the morning of their anniversary of how many years they'd been at the school, all of the counselors would arrive at their bed in the morning and say, and have a gift for each year they were there, and each gift symbolized in some way some progress they had made. And we would, and of course the kids would love it because we'd have to describe what, oh well here you've made this growth. And it was about celebrating their strengths and their progress. So Jeff decided, he goes, Kim, you've almost worked for, with me for a year. And I said, yeah. And he said, um, I, I want to do something for you because you've made such a difference. And I said, well, what? He goes, I, I'd like to bring you breakfast in bed. Like, could, you, could I make breakfast? That kind of like you do on Mother's Day because he'd never had that experience. So I said, well, I get you guys up for bed. Like, I get you up and off to school. He goes, then you have to go back to your room. <laughs> I said, okay. And he got special permission. And, and he went and he made me this scrambled eggs, actually. And, um, you know, on a tray and had a flower and then a card. And in the card, uh, it just wrenched my heart because what he told me was that he always thought of himself as such a horrible child, a horrible kid, disgusting. And he said that that one night that I got up in the night and made him the scrambled eggs was the first time that he ever considered that maybe he was not so bad if someone would get up and make him those eggs and stuff. Um, he also did tell me they were the worst scrambled eggs he ever tasted. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, Jeff kind of had that edge and <laughs> thing going. <laughs> still, um, just uh, fast forward many years, Jeff and I still are on email. Are on email now. He is uh, married with three children in Denver and uh, has written a few books. He's uh, actually a, a genius at computers. He was taking courses on computer science at University of Chicago when he was 14 and 15 and stuff. But it just, I'm telling that story for a couple of reasons here and talking about social and emotional learning because I think the thing is is that we have to, well first of all I think stories are a way for us to educate the heart. <laughs> I think that you know using stories with children, finding out their stories, finding things that are personally meaningful are so critical. But the other thing is is that how was I able to respond in that way to this boy? What was it that I, I, what were the conditions for me to be able to help him and respond that way is because the place I was working I was so attentive to taking care of the adults. Like there was so much given to not just blaming you and saying, oh, that was a stupid thing you did or that was, but it was always the, adult, the people who supervised us always responded with empathy and always started with the strengths and always said, I remember a time when I was new, I did something like that. And so it's the idea of how you support and lead with empathy and the teachers that you're supporting with what goes on there. So anyway, so now I'm going to have you do a bit of an activity, get up and walk around a bit. So a greeting activity. Do you guys know each other? Sort of, kind of. You've you had a couple of days together. Okay. Move around the room and silently greet your colleagues until I call stop. Then you're going to find a partner and introduce yourself with your name. And then um, think about, uh, share with each other what are the most important knowledge, skills, and dispositions that you want students to have when they finish their education and why. And then think to both take turns talking about what are the most important skills, knowledge, skills, and dispositions that you want students to have when they finish their education and why. So I'll give you a few minutes for that. I just want to take a minute to um, hear about some of the things that you discovered and then in this next little while we're going to go about 
17 more minutes. I, said, I promised Maureen I'm ending at 2.30, right, my dear? Um, I just want to share with you a couple of recent research findings and then a really cool practical strategy that I'm going to send. But you know, there's much more in my talk. But let me first feel, what were some of the things that people felt were the um, sort of skills, competencies that students should have when they graduate, when they finish their education? What were some of the things? Curiosity. Curiosity. Sense of community. Self-confidence. Self yes, self-confidence or oh, which kindness? Yes, kindness. I can. I can. That believe. Yeah, yeah. The resiliency. Not afraid to take risks. You no, know, it's interesting. We wonder in our society now with the risk taking and do we insulate our children too much? Anyway, it's just an interesting. Yes sort of working together, that collaboration and problem solving together. Any other? Yes? Yes, the curiosity. Or do we uh, do the drill and kill? And <laughs> It's interesting. Um, yes. What do we do? How can we keep that love of learning? Um, so many of the things that you were mentioning are things that are part of social and emotional learning. So we know the sort of five dimensions that CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic Social Emotional Learning, has identified is something like a self-awareness, being able to be aware of your strengths and weaknesses, your sense of confident, confidence in your abilities, knowing your strengths, um, a sense of um, self-aware, uh, social awareness, being empathy, kind, aware of others' perspectives, self-management, how to manage your own emotions. What do you do when you're angry? What do you do when you're sad? And really understanding that. Um, even the idea of the social or self-awareness, who do you need to go to for help when you have a problem? I think that's something we don't spend enough time explicitly helping students to develop that skill of who do you go to? Who are the people in your network? Um, relationship skills and of course responsible decision making. Those are all of those dimensions of social and emotional learning. I want to um, highlight for some of you who were here last time, but for the new people as well, there's a great new, there's a website that I, uh, two websites that I have to say you have to go see. Well, I'll save more. Okay. One is CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. It has a new, um, anyways, they have some new things on there. But the other one that's really good and has lots of new stuff is Edutopia. Um, there's that guy named George Lucas that, you know, George Lucas Educational Foundation, and there's a brand new video on social and emotional learning that's about five minutes long. I'm not showing it, but it was launched mid-May, and they have attached to it a number of resources, lesson plans, um, just so much more things. I have to say, there's actually, if you go on there, there's book lists for different grade levels, starting in kindergarten, of books and what, what different SEL competencies they focus on, empathy, compassion, and you could just go on there and find, I'll, I'll put the link in, in, my, in my PowerPoint for you guys so you could go see the book list. And, and then the other one is the Greater Good uh, Science Center at University of California, Berkeley. Just Google the Greater Good at Berkeley and there's so many things on there, videos and lesson plans and things like that. And so the one thing I wanted to uh, share with you is sort of a recent uh, scientific finding. And, and one of the things that I um, needed some help with getting your thinking about this is this, um, this idea recent, of recent research really showing, and I've showed this before, and I'm showing a few things again and some new things, is this idea that we used to have this belief that children are ba basically aggressive and their natural human tendency is to be aggressive and um, antisocial, and that we kind of tame kids and socialize them not to be aggressive. And in fact, the um, Globe and Mail several years ago had a picture of, uh, uh, and said, the most violent people on earth, two and a half year olds. And um, really this idea that somehow children are self-centered and egocentric and really are always looking out for their own gains. And if we see children through that lens, we will 
organize the classroom very differently than if we see them through a different lens. We'll respond to their behaviors in a different way if we perceive that it, they're only motivated by self-interest. And so I'm hoping that through uh, trying to show how shifting that lens, as I did with Jeff, with this idea of here's this kid who's asking me to pick up his dirty laundry, if I look at it in a different way of him connecting with me, not being this you know, self-centered kid who's trying to, you know, um, boss me around, so to speak. But if I look at it in a different way, so I'm hoping that this will help you in this other way. So we know, um, for example, some of the recent research says, you know, we now know so much more about infants. Actually, I don't know if anyone's seen this, the research on infants that showed, shows that they actually prefer the person, that they do puppet shows. Has anyone seen this? It's so cool. They do puppet shows and they show one puppet being really nice and the other puppet being kind of mean and then they offer, they have a graham cracker and they offer the nice puppet and the mean puppet offered and they always take it from the nice puppet even six-month-olds. Um, there's a great uh, video, you can Google it and watch it for free, David Suzuki, called Born to be Good, that talks about, about this research on infancy. But the research I've been talking about um, is this research with Felix Wernicken and Michael Tomasello looking at do 18-month-olds help without any expectation of reward? Are they altruistic? And they set up, I'm going to show you a couple and see some of the things. So they set up these um, different activities and to see if these 18-month-olds, um, and it's so fascinating, Felix Wernicken, actually no one had ever studied this before because everyone thought, to, you know, toddlers are egocentric. They can't think of other people's perspectives. Why would we even do experiments looking at that? And so they set this up, and I'll just show you this. Some of you have seen these before, but I'm going to show them again here. So um, they set up a number of experiments. They did it with chimpanzees too, just to see if it's a human tendency and found that chimps not as much, but will also behave in these altruistic ways. Um, here's another one that's my favorite. I love that look. I watch it. I've seen it so many times, and that baby's just like, wow, you know, did you really? You couldn't figure it out. Come on. <laughs> so um, the thing is, I want to emphasize here two things. One is this idea of of really understanding children and setting up conditions where they can behave in a pro-social way, giving them opportunities to help, to collaborate, to, uh, you know, I, I think I have to say one of the things that I love of buddy reading programs, I think the idea when you have an older kid helping a younger child and younger children, I mean, the more that you can involve them in helping, if it's this idea that they develop, and it actually, in the classroom, if you set up a pro-social classroom where everyone, it's like we are part of a family that all helps each other and works together and, you know, we celebrate everyone's success. Everyone's success is all of our success. Um, but anyways, uh, so anyway, so that's an important thing. But to think about if you perceive how you perceive a child's behavior. Now, one of the things that they did after this is they did another study to see is having the parent there is actually, if you start thinking about the experiment, having a parent there, does that matter? Is that why the child is helping? Because their parent is there and they're wanting to get their parent's approval. So they did a study without the parents there. And even having the parents encourage them to do the helping, and it didn't interfere in any way. They still continued to help. If the parent was there or not there, if the parent encouraged or didn't encourage, they helped to the same degree. So they did a number of studies looking at that. Then the next thing was, OK, is it something about getting the adult's approval implicitly? The adult is there getting the object, you know, the child is doing it. So they set up an experiment to see, would children still help if there's no adult watching? Will they still behave in this pro-social way, even if the adult isn't somehow re 
acknowledging them. So they set it up where this 18 month old again has a really fun toy they're playing with. So they even gave them a distraction, like a really fun thing that they're playing with. An adult whose back is turned and then had something happen to see if, the, if this toddler would still help. Let's see what happens. In there. Stops to do the toy. These are the same size. No, no. Put that here and put this one here. And this one here. You can. And this one can go right there. And this one so here. Then the next study um, that others have done is finding that giving leads to happiness in young ch children. Now, my question for you is, um, when we look at pro-social behavior and this helping kind behavior, across elementary schools, it actually goes down. Children become less helpful, sharing, and cooperative across the elementary school years. Why? Why do you think that happens? And what can we do to disrupt that pattern of going, of decreased one? Now I have one idea that might be, and then we're gonna have, I'm gonna have you do a reflection, bless you, a reflection for a minute. So there is some other research that they did that they actually set it up to see if extrinsic rewards, what happens if you use extrinsic rewards? Do you think in school, do we ever use extrinsic rewards? <laughs> do you think? Okay, so they set up this experiment based on um, different theories. Very, it's interesting, there's very little research to see when you're looking at helpful, caring behavior, if you reward it, um, what happens to it. There's one study done with, you know, the coloring marker study with the kindergartners, where they had kindergartners who intrinsically are motivated to play with coloring markers, and then they started paying them, giving them toys if they got played with the coloring markers, and they start, stopped playing with them. And they call it something called the over-justification hypothesis. I'll teach you that today, over-justification hypothesis. That if you are doing something that's intrinsically rewarding, but then you get some sort of extrinsic reward for it, that you start now thinking, well, I only should do it if I get the extrinsic reward. And you actually only do it under those conditions. So it takes away, I think different parts of the brain must light up or something. I don't know quite the biology of it. Um, Anyway, so they did a study um, where they had t uh, two and a half year olds, is it uh, 20 month olds, and they set up one group who got, uh, did a helpful thing just like you saw in the first one where they helped open a cabinet or pick up a, something that was hard to reach. And when they did it, they got a, a cube, a toy cube, like thank you very much, there's your toy cube. The next group, they helped, they got a, oh thank you very much, that was so nice for helping me. And the third group, nothing, no response whatsoever when they did the helping. And what you saw was the kids who had the neutral condi condition, who um, did not get any response, continued to help at high degrees. The kids who had the praise condition also continued to help, but the children who got the extrinsic reward actually helped less. They, and this is, uh, anyways, so. So my question, this is just gonna be the last two minutes here. Um, and you're not going to be able to do all of this, but I just wonder, why do you think it is? What do you think is the reason behind that? And can we, I, I guess my point here is, is, should we not reward kids for doing helpful behavior? Should we just acknowledge them for doing it when they act in a caring way? Anyway, ideas? It's just kind of a, what do you guys think? So take a minute, and then I just have one last thing I'm gonna show you. So I, f I feel like I'm, 
the person here who's going to give you just some provocative research findings. Um, the one thing I do want to emphasize, um, and just, you know, like reading, social and emotional learning is not about a program. You can't just get a program and say, one day a week for 45 minutes we're doing social and emotional learning. Oh, it's done. <laughs> you know, it's about a way of, uh, I say, in the floors and the doors, and it's got to be embodied by the teacher. And um, anyway, so just, it's a really important point to take that even if you say, people say, oh, I'm doing mind up. We're doing social and emotional learning. To me, that's maybe one vehicle to actually bring in the conversation, but it has to be infused in everything, and I keep on going back to that. And I'm going to end with just a really cool recent research finding that would be great to start off. So do you know how you decorate, one of the things you start thinking about at the beginning of the school, you're decorating your classroom. Setting up the classroom and figuring out what am I going to have on the walls, how am I going to organize the desks, you know. And first of all, I have to tell you, always engage students in that discussion. Always, always. They always come up with much better ideas. Anyway, but here's a recent study. They looked at, um, again, 18-month-olds, but I think it transfers to older kids. They did a study to see if, um, if you show different pictures, will it prime to be affiliation? So they sent, they did this study here. Let me just show you what they had. So they had these four teapots. The first teapot, sorry if you can't see it, are two little uh, dolls standing next to each other looking at each other. The next one is just a doll by itself. The third one is just blocks. The fourth one is the dolls not, uh, looking away from each other, back to back. They found that when children were exposed, this is a randomized experiment, were exposed to the one with the, the picture with the two dolls facing each other, kind of in collaboration, they were more likely to help in a situation. So that just by seeing a picture of two people together actually made them more likely in another situation to help someone. So think about this. If teachers are setting up classrooms or schools to have pictures and posters that actually have people collaborating and connecting could be priming the students to be, work in a collaborative way by just having those pictures on the wall. Isn't that so cool? You know, but it's just... Um, Again, it, and it just says here, when setting up your classroom, hang posters of people interacting with each other. As this study demonstrates, even a subtle image of two people looking at each other can create a sense of connectedness and foster kindness. So I'm going to end there. Thank you very much.